Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the last session of Essentials for the Year. Uh, my name is Dale Franklin, um, and we have a jam-packed session today. We've certainly saved the best for last, so we have a full team talking to you today about the best five local and global share picks for 2022. Um, certainly, this has been an absolute pleasure to host you for this year. We've generated over 2,500 CPD points for financial planners, and we've covered subjects as wide as Africa to flex income to building an SA equity portfolio. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who probably doesn't need to be introduced to this panel. Probably the most regular speaker of Essentials is Peter Armitage. Peter Armitage is the CEO of Anchor Group. He's also the co-CIO of Anchor Asset Management. Pete will be hosting the discussion today and introducing the various fund managers and analysts. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Peter. Thanks, Sal, and welcome to all of you. We've got another um, great attendance, and hopefully today we'll give you some food for thought and some interesting ideas. The focus of today is to, we've got five of our analysts and fund managers talking about specific shares. And um, we're going to try and identify five interesting local and five interesting global shares. They're not necessarily in all of our portfolios, and the portfolios obviously have different mandates and um, different risk return profiles. But we did try and find some stuff that's interesting um, and some stuff which indicates how we approach the uh, uh, approach investment, how we pick our shares, and mirroring our philosophy. From a market perspective, it's been a phenomenal year. Um, the, 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 the all share index is up 18%, uh, the FTSE is up 10%, the S&P is up 24%. And um, the difficult spot this year has been emerging markets with the Hang Seng down 12 and MSCI emerging, emerging markets down about 5% in the last month. So by and large, if you've taken some equity risk, you've had a pretty good year. And particularly on a two-year view, you know, if you go back to the beginning of last year, <clears throat> the, the, the world markets are up about 30% since the beginning of last year. And certainly with all the turmoil that we face, it's been a fantastic outcome. So um, we, we, we're very chuffed with what we've been able to do to deliver to clients. And as we enter into next year, of course, there's things to worry about. The, la the latest COVID wave has created a bit of turmoil in markets of late. Um, all indications at the moment, it's still very on, very early on is that um, you know, the, it doesn't look like this version of the, uh, of, of the virus is going to create significantly more, more turmoil. Uh, but really, the scientists have got to give us answers for that over the course of the next few weeks. Um, the global markets have run pretty hard. Uh, the, the, the question mark is whether we're at the end of the party. Um, valuations are about 25% higher than average over time. Um, so we are looking at things with quite some caution. But within that, um, we can put together a portfolio that we're very comfortable to own um, for a reasonable time period. So if, if interest rates go up, um, banks can benefit quite nicely, and banks are looking like pretty good value. Um, pharmaceutical companies um, are looking quite cheap. You'll hear from David Gibb, who's going to talk through um, an interesting company that he's, that he's put into his portfolio. Uh, on the growth and kind of the multi-bagger side, Nick Dennis is going to tell us about some, uh, some growth businesses, focus on one or two that he owns. Um, and, you know, the one thing we know for certain is that where the markets go up or down, where the long-term long bond yields are 1.5% or 2% in America, and there's companies doing their thing, and there's companies creating uh, enormous value, and our job is to make sure that you invested in those at the right valuations. So we are cautious going on, uh, moving on into 2022, largely because of, because of valuations. Um, we sit in quite a complex and concerning environment where, you know, US 10-year bond yields are 1.5%, but inflation is sitting at about 6%. So that really does have to come down over the course of the year. We're definitely going to see a rise in interest rates and long-term bond yields, um, which is ultimately the, the reference um, for the discount rates around the world and has a huge implication on valuations. So like any year, um, we're going to head into next year with a lot of things to look out for, a lot of things to be cautious about. Um, but like we always say to people at the end of the year, there were 10 things to worry about and nine of them we didn't need to. The art, of course, is trying to find the one that uh, you did need to worry about. Um, but we ultimately, the, our approach is very much bottom up um, and we're able to identify some companies that we think look pretty exciting. 
So without further ado, I'm going to ha now hand over to, um, to Mike Gresty. Uh, Mike joined us uh, quite some years ago now. Um, he's a key part of our investment process. Mike is an award-winning um, financial analyst. He's, he's run research teams across some of the big investment banks in, in, in South Africa, uh, plays an integral part in our, our local and offshore processes. And Mike's going to start off talking about multi-choice. So over to you, Mike. Great, Pete. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I suppose that the first share we're going to talk to you is probably going to be a bit of a surprise to you all because since it listed and was spun out of NASPAs in 2019, this has been anything but a standout performer. And, uh, you know, we're certainly picking it as one of the shares for which things get really interesting in the next year. So just to give you a bit of context initially, um, obviously, most of the focus when people think about multi-choice is the South African business, and no surprises there. It's the uh, big cash cow, and obviously well known to everyone here. But I think obviously what we're going to highlight to you is the degree to which this is a business that is much more than just SA Pay TV. And it's exactly that that we think um, investors are going to be forced to acknowledge in the next year or so. So uh, alongside the South African business, um, you've got the loss-making African business, which at the time uh, multi-choice was listed separately. Management uh, gave guidance that this business would turn profitable uh, by uh, 2023. And as that approaches, you know, things get interesting. Aside from that, you have the small technology business. So Edeto does the uh, essentially a lot of the security around their set-top boxes, and they've looked to really monetize that elsewhere. And then very recently, you've seen multi-choice start to invest in a number of, you know, new seeds for growth, if you like. The market not currently recognizing those at all, uh, but BetKing as an online betting business in Africa at very early stage. And then uh, Aura is a, a new technology platform in South Africa, which has made an early stage investment. And if we move on, Pete, let's get into the story. So essentially... If you look at very simply the way uh, multi-choice looks, um, and we're focusing very much on the, on the pay TV businesses, if you isolate the South African business, it generates roughly between 14 and almost 16 rand of near cash earnings. Um, this year is going to be a little bit weaker because we've seen a lot of deferred content spend that's been pushed into this year as a result of the um, you know, the fact that a lot of sport in particular didn't happen in the, in the COVID period. But if you think of that business, as I say, as a pretty slow growing, let's say 15 rand cash earnings generator, you know, what you deduce is that at around 120 rand share price, it's effectively implying a negative value on the rest of the business. Um, now, that's probably been reasonable historically, given the losses that you've seen in Africa, but despite the turbulence we've seen through COVID and the currency volatility, it's been steadily making progress towards break even. And as I mentioned earlier on, that's expected to happen um, in the next financial year. Note that it's a, it's a March year end. So when we say FY23, that's actually effectively in next year. And that's why I made the point that I think things get very interesting uh, in terms of how investors see this business next year. You can see that we're still forecasting a small loss. Um, but as I say, I think that gives us a degree of conservatism. Certainly, the, the, the management team are guiding to stronger results going forward, um, and hopefully they will beat us on that, and you see the business turn profitable. So really, it's as the, res the, the market starts to realize that there's more to this business than simply South Africa, um, you know, driving those earnings, those earnings forward. You, you, if you look at the rating at the moment, um, it's trading on a forward PE of about 12 times. But because of the rapidly receding losses in Africa and as it turns profitable, it's a business that's compounding its earnings at around the mid-teens level um, with a dividend yield because of that very strong cash generation out of Africa um, of around 6%. And obviously, that's expected to grow strongly as the cash drag from Africa recedes. So, you know, the key message here, it's a share for which we think the whole ex-South Africa opportunity is more than just not priced into the share, and that's going to become very difficult to justify as the business continues to um, hit its targets around turning that profitable. So that's probably the story on multi-choice. If we move to the next one, and we're going to change gears here, 
Um, so AFRIMAT, uh, now we're talking resources uh, and, and um, infrastructure. You know, very interesting business that we've followed for some time. Quite a small business, uh, been a little bit under the radar screen, but one that we particularly like because of the excellent capital allocation track record that it has built up over a long period of time. So if you look back at AFRIMAT uh, in 2012, this was a pretty boring quarrying business, essentially. Low return business, low margin um, really producing materials for the construction sector, aggregate, cement bricks, uh, and so on. And through a, a series of you know, regular acquisitions over the next decade, the business has really transformed itself and increasingly today looks like essentially a mid-tier diversified miner. And what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides is the degree to which that transition is actually going to become much more apparent and importantly, because of acquisitions that it's already got in the bag, you have very strong, um, if I can call it, organic growth as those new commodities start to come on stream. So if we look at the first half results, um, you know, what, I, what we're showing here is the split of, of bottom line profits. You can see that bulk commodities, which is essentially com completely made up of iron ore out of one mine, which is Demining, um, you know, uh, absolutely dominating earnings. Um, and certainly you would have to acknowledge that iron ore had a fantastic period in the last few months. So admittedly, it probably over-earned a little bit in the first half. But what I want to highlight is if you think of Demining and that 78% as let's say 100 units, call it 100 rand or whatever you like, what are some of the new additions going to add to this business over the next couple of years? So Nkumati mine, which is in Mpumalanga, generates a very high-grade uh, anthracite. This business came on stream in, in the first half. It was still making losses. So it lost about $100 million in the first half of this year, turned profitable in August. And the way to think about this business is now it's contributing um, a regular income stream every month. As that annualizes, that effectively equates to another demining which is not in the historic numbers. Jenkins um, is a new mine that it has just brought on stream. Again, iron ore contributed almost nothing to the first half of the year, now fully on stream and producing. Um, as you annualize that, that's equivalent of two demonings coming on stream, and it's happening right as we speak. Um, something a little bit further out is the Grafenacher manganese deposit that is busy developing. Um, this is only going to come on stream in 2023, so a little bit away from, from where we are today. Um, and that potentially, as it comes on full stream, equates to another demining. So, yes, you have some volatility around uh, uh, commodity prices, but relative to, let's say, a BHP or an Anglo, which is you know far more just a call on what commodity prices are going to do, you have the appeal in this business of very substantial um, organic growth as a result of acquisitions that it has already got in the bag. So essentially just these businesses add another kind of four times demining um, over the next couple of years. And if we now look at the next slide with you know, earnings growth and rating, uh, you can see how as these new um, opportunities come on stream, as these new mines begin contributing, you get that very strong ramp up in um, earnings. And essentially, you know, I think a lot of people will be saying, well, what on earth assumptions are you using around pricing for iron ore to get these numbers, we're assuming a price of around $110 a ton. So slightly ahead of uh, where it is today, we're at around the $100 level, but certainly well, well south of the north of 200 we saw in the last few months. So as I say, a really nice um, sort of under the radar, quite cheap, fast growing mining play uh, to keep your eyes on. And that's it from me for now. Oh, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about one kind of smaller cap company, um, a business called Alviva. Many of you would know of it as, uh, as Pinnacle, changed its name a few years ago. Now, in the small cap segment of the market, there's been a lot of value, and fund managers have um, not been prepared to value things at the same kind of price level that uh, the private market has, and hence we've seen a lot of delistings and corporate actions. Um, and Alviva is one, a, a, a reasonable quality business with a lot of critical mass that still sits at that really beleaguered valuation. Um, Alviva, Alviva is not a fantastic business. It's, it, you know, it's very much a distribution um, uh, uh, kind of working capital type business. It's tended to trade at an eight to nine PE multiple, but it's currently trading at a four PE multiple. 
And while it's a small cap, it's quite a big business. So we think that it's annualizing turnover at about 20 billion rand at the moment. I'm just looking back to Mike's uh, AFRIMAT, which is sitting at about 5 billion, albeit at much higher margins. And we think it can make over a billion rand of EBITDA in the coming year. Um, and the, the market value is 1.8 billion. So you can see it's making back uh, in, in less than two years, it's making its, uh, its market cap in EBITDA. Or in cash flow terms, making, you know, it'll make its entire market cap back over the course of three to three and a half years. So June 2021, they did uh, earnings per share of 356 cents, which is back to 2019 levels. And that was in spite of the supply constraints that they've had. Um, they've fallen squarely in that segment of the market, which, you know, the chip shortages, battling to get laptops, battling to get a lot of equipment. And they reckon if they actually be, had been able to access all of their demand, the results would have been a lot higher. So a lot of, a lot of latent demand out there, stock levels are quite low. Because as like laptops and the like are coming in, they're just going straight out to clients. They've just bought out their biggest competitor, Tarsus, um, in, a, in what we think will be a phenomenal deal from Investec, who are actively trying to get out of those kind of private equity plays. Um, they only pay about 10% of their earnings as a dividend, and we think that's held the share price back. And so what have they done with the cash? They've paid off uh, almost all of their debt, but what they've been doing is buying back their shares. Because they're so cheap, um, they've plowed a lot of money into this. Last year, they bought back over 10% of their shares. And at a 4 PE multiple, they're getting a 25% return on the share acquisitions. So it's a classic SA small cap situation um, with the market being unwilling to pay up to a reasonable value, um, which we think either the company or somebody else, somebody else will do something about. So this is trading at just below 15 Rand, and we think could be comfortably worth well in excess of 20 Rand. We'll now move on to Liam Hector. Liam's been with us for about seven years. He's based in London when COVID allows him to be. Um, he covers emerging markets, uh, runs our very successful and award-winning um, Anchor Accelerator hedge fund. And he's going to talk to us about two South African shares and a, a Chinese tech share, uh, which is obviously a very contentious but possibly quite attractive uh, segment of the market at the moment. So I'll hand over to you, Liam. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so so the, the two companies I'll discuss, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning them both up front is uh, Transaction Capital and Investec. And uh, it, it, you know, when we were discussing this uh, this morning, these two shares, it's, it's quite funny. I, I think I presented on the exact two um, investment cases in a similar forum about six years ago when I when I was a, an analyst in Joburg. And uh, it's, it's amazing how the, the fortunes of the two companies have, have kind of diverged. But, but once again, um, you know, presenting what we think are, are great uh, investment opportunities. So Transaction Capital is a company that we've owned uh, and, and we first purchased on about a five times or six times forward PE after they had done a, some corporate restructuring. And it's been great to it's been a great example on the JSC of um, good execution from a capital, capital allocation point of view. And, um, and, and how they've added a, 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 another pillar to their business in the acquisition of We Buy Cars. So when we first uh, invested, they only, well, the, the whole business was basically SA Taxi and, and we've watched the growth of transaction capital risk services come through. But we just wanted to sort of uh, give an illustration in this slide as to how much each of the divisions um, on a fully loaded basis contribute to operating profit. So they've taken retained earnings and, and uh, done some, uh, capital raises over time, and they've acquired a, a business called We Buy Cars to add the, the third vertical. Um, they paid about a nine and a half times forward um, earnings of, of, on the numbers that, that have been achieved so far for about 75% of the business. Um, and if you included We Buy Cars for the full year last year to create some kind of trailing earnings number um, in, uh, for, for a full period, you're looking at a trailing earnings number of a, a profit after tax number of about 1.1 billion rand. Um, they recorded, they reported about 1 billion rand because we buy cars wasn't owned for the full period. But this is just to illustrate how, uh, how the, just by having we buy cars in, in the mix is going to add to earnings growth in, in the year ahead. So, you know, with our expected growth rates in, in the various businesses, uh, we buy cars still quite a high growth business. Um, we think that they'll, they'll be able to you know, do about 1.35 million in, in profit after tax next year, um, which represents growth of 35% on the number that they reported this year of a billion. 
So, you know, transaction capital, um, a great story on the JSE of, of a company that's executed well, it's been able to grow um, in a market where growth has been very hard to come by, particularly for financial services businesses. And um, also pleasing are, are the growth rates in, in the businesses that, that are, that are um, legacy businesses or all the core businesses that have built transaction capital to begin with. So very stable investment case. Um, and, and, you know, obviously we've seen the, the, four to, the forward five times earnings go to somewhere in, in the region of forward 20 times earnings now. Um, obviously a bit of a concern uh, from a valuation perspective, but we would also highlight that um, in, in the sense of we buy cars, They've bought a much higher multiple business in the mix. So, you know, obviously very nice um, for a company to acquire a, a business on a lower multiple than uh, what we think it would have fetched if it was separately listed. And if you look at uh, examples of, of similar types of businesses around the world, uh, you know, we can point to some of them in the UK and the US. Um, these businesses are trading on very, very lofty multiples. Um, it's difficult to know what a PE multiple for them are, are going to be when they reach scale because the, the others are all trading on uh, revenue multiples. So definitely um, justified that there was some form of re-rating. Um, and, uh, you know, we are very happy shareholders. The management have, have executed really well. They've always delivered on, on what they said that they were going to do and, and always been transparent and honest with the market. Um, and, and in addition, the deal they did by selling a portion of SA Taxi to Santaco, we think is one of the best corporate deals we've seen over the last uh, number of years in the JSE, in a sense, um, you know, wrapping that business uh, in a bit of cotton wool with regards to the, the Taxi Fund Association in South Africa. So we think excellent um, corporate stewardship from, from the team at Transaction Capital and uh, yeah, very happy shareholders and, and expect good things in, in the coming years. Moving on to Investec, um, this is this is a slide that we probably wouldn't uh, often show as the as the leading slide for the investment case of Investec. But the reason why we do show it on a, on an earnings basis now and not one of segregating the the different divisions out and valuing them as a sum of the parts is that for the first time in a, in a long time and and maybe why we we starting to generate some good performance from Investec. The investment case is now hinging on on earnings growth and, and growth and operating profit. Whereas previously it was much more around um, a deep value um, investment case where there was there was a lot of trap value in the structure and management needed to you know almost reshuffle the cards or, or deck chairs just to create um, the optics that the business was generating a higher return on capital than than it actually was. So for the first time in in you know recent memory, um, Investex operating momentum is, is starting to get, gather steam and uh, and you know for us as as managers who are far more focused on on earnings um, as opposed to trying to identify bottom-up value cases. Um, Investec, you know, create, is now representing a much uh, more attractive um, investment case to us than, than it was uh, a while ago. So on a, on a forward six and a half times earnings where you've got quite a lot of upgrades coming through, um, you know, they, they've reported to the half to, for the year ending September, we think that there's at least 15% um, upside to earnings expectations after they reported, and you started to see um, analyst estimates coming up. We would uh, also just note that it is trading um, cum about 10 rand of distributions, two rand of that is cash, and, and then about eight rand um, of that is um, the, the, bulk, the bulk of their stake in N91 uh, listed um, in London in the JSE. So, you know, once that, that distribution happens, we also think that that's going to be quite accretive to return on equity. So justifying a, a higher multiple to book um, than the bank's currently trading. So, you know, very pleasing that um, for once our, our investment case on, on Investec is, is one of, of um, focusing on the earnings. Um, and earnings growth, and, and we think that the, the current management team refined focus, uh, new sets of targets, um, really cleaning up shop is is hopefully going to deliver um, on on sort of good shareholder total returns for for investors. Um, with the obvious caveats that you know, as with Investec, uh, you know, there's there always se seems to be um, something that that sort of uh, the, the left tails is, risk is quite high with this one. So, um, you know, recently there were, there were headlines around um, their, their involvement in, in some um, accounting or, or um, arbitrage scandals in, in Europe. And, um, you know, we'll obviously monitor the developments. We have spoken to them and it seems like uh, the, the, um, 
the exposure is quite ring fenced uh, within one entity with low with low financial impacts to the business from what they can um, I guess quantify at this point in time. So yeah, Investec still offering very good value for us, uh, and and we'll continue to hold the stock. And now moving off the JSE towards uh, into other markets, but sticking with emerging markets. Um, JD.com uh, is a is is an e-commerce business listed in China. Um, you might not know it, but it is it is probably the largest e-commerce business, um, Chinese pure play e-commerce business. Whereas Alibaba operates more as a marketplace business. So JD.com actually does uh, they have different business models, but they do compete and in, in, uh, you know pretty much head on in, in most markets. Um, the the, the the real crux to JD.com and, and you know the, the outperformance this year, JD.com has outperformed remarkably in, in the context of China internet. But really what happened was in January, February this year, when when um, the regulators started coming down and imposing the, the first round of regulations that, that seemed to um, target specifically e-commerce uh, in, in China, uh, JD.com was a net beneficiary of, of certain of the changes that came through. So there was a there was certain practices that uh, the dominant players in China were um, seemingly abusing their their market power. So JD, uh, Alibaba was was telling certain merchants that um, they can only if they're going to transact on J, on Alibaba's platform, they're not allowed to transact um, with JD.com. It was it was never written in stone, but it was kind of implied. And the regulator came down on that, and as a result, um, JD.com was a big net beneficiary. So you know, obviously, we've seen. Um, a complete turmoil in, in uh, across the Chinese internet space this year. Um, negative headline after negative headline, and and still pretty negative sentiment right up until now. You know, mid late November, and this this really kicked off about a year ago. Um, but but it's, this is just to highlight that some companies have actually benefited from the changes that were made, and and in a way. To, to try and illustrate that in numbers, you know, Alibaba's core, core e-commerce business for, um, over the last three months, I think, grew only 3%, um, so low, mid, single digits. And JD.com was able to put on, you know, 25% earnings growth or uh, revenue growth over that time. And uh, for the nine months in September, they were growing still top line at about 30%. And this is not a small business. Um, it's got a market cap of, of over $100 billion. Uh, and, and it's been one that, you know, for us, has been a very um, pleasing investment case in the context of um, you know the the Hong Kong Golden Dragon Index, which is down you know I, I don't know the exact number, but probably in the region of thirty to forty percent for the and, and JD.com is up. Um, another example would in, in with a similar kind of investment case is NetEase having outperformed remarkably relative to ten cents. I think it's quite a similar um, which NetEase is also a competitor of ten cents in the gaming space. I think it's quite a similar. Um, scenario that's played out there where the regulations have set, like really protected the the uh, well attacked the dominant player and protected some of the the peripheral players so you know jd.com excellent execution um and and great uh, revenue momentum and as a result maintained its rating and uh, and and we'll we'll continue to hold this as as our core sort of um chinese internet pillar in our, in our portfolios okay thanks liam I'm now going to hand over to David Gibb. Dave's been with us uh, almost since the beginning of Anchor, eight or nine years ago. Um, he runs the Worldwide Flexible Fund, um, which if, if guys are looking for something that's a little bit more conservative next year, he owns a fair, a fair bit of cash, quite valuation sensitive. So there's quite a bit of financials and, uh, and pharma in it. Um, so Dave, Dave will give you a nice flavor of uh, an interesting share that he's going to talk about. He's done a lot of work in the pharma space. Dave also runs our global tech fund, um, which has been a star since launch about two years ago. So over to you, Dave. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. So in in Anchor's global tech unit, we're always looking for new industries, which we think offer tremendous potential uh, in in the years ahead. Um, And we've come across uh, a a new industry called synthetic biology, um, where Ginkgo Bioworks uh, appears to be the leader in that field. And we think that, you know, this new field offers that sort of enormous potential that we might see uh, in the decades ahead. So, you know, let's move on to the next slide, uh, Pete. 
So if you look at uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, it was started well over a decade ago by uh, five MIT graduates. Um, they're all shown over there. Um, and the chap second from the right is the, the CEO, Jason Kelly. Um, and the business uh, is synthetic biology. Basically what they do is they program cells. Uh, so that would be the genetic uh, code uh, the base pairs, so that'll be A, C, G, and, uh, and T, um, just like a software company might program a computer so to then perform a particular task. So they have been through their formative years. They, you know, they relied on, on academic grants and government grants in the beginning, but now the big business is becoming, uh, it's, it's now taking on a lot of business and I think it's gone through that inflection point. And I think this is a, a tremendously exciting area for, for the decades ahead. So if we look at the next slide, basically what a customer would do would be to approach uh, Ginkgo uh, with uh, a, a certain specification. They might want, for example, a food company might approach them and say, we would like... Um, an animal-free protein that looks and tastes um, like, uh, you know, like, like meat. Uh, and could you come up with a product uh, like that that isn't actually based on, on animal protein? So Ginkgo, in this case, and one of their, uh, one of their <laughs> existing clients, um, uh, they would take a fungal cell uh, from their vast uh, code base that they've developed over the years with hundreds of thousands of different cells or fungal cells or bacterial cells. But in this case, they will take a fungal cell. They will modify the genetic material of that cell until uh, it meets the, the, the requirements of that client. Um, and then they will put it through their foundry, which is effectively their factory, uh, and they will produce that cell for the client and then come out with the output, which will be, uh, you know, to deliver on the cell program for a, for a particular client. Now, this could be applied across a range of different industries, and they have clients in the cosmetics industry. They may want uh, Ginkgo to produce um, a, a molecule that smells like a peach, for example, in cosmetics or in the flavorance industry or in the agricultural industry or in pharmaceuticals. Um, and once they've produced the cell for their client, they then take a royalty on any future sales made by, by that company. So uh, it's new in its life now. If we just turn to the next slide, um, in their latest uh, reported results, um, right on the, on, on the left-hand side here, you can see in the Q3, they started 10 new cell programs. Uh, where clients approach them with particular specifications for a new cell. Um, and, and for the year to date, um, they have now got um, 61 programs that, they, that they've worked on uh, this year. Um, and we think this is an, uh, uh, an incredibly exciting area for a company that now has a market cap of $20 billion. Um, their revenues are growing strongly, and we expect the revenues to go up many, many times over the next five years. So it's a, this is a new investment for us uh, in our global tech fund. Uh, we've also bought a, a smaller stake in our Worldwide Flex Fund um, and the business listed in September. And you know we're very excited about the team and their leadership in this new field of synthetic biology. Uh, back to you, Pete. Great, we're now gonna hand over to Nick Dennis. Um, Nick has been a star on the South African landscape over the course of the last few years. He runs our global equity fund, um, which at the end of last year was the top performing fund over five years, been generating a return of around 18% per annum in dollars. Uh, Nick is, uh, follows the approach of trying to populate his portfolio with multi-baggers, um, taking the view that companies that can multiply their, themselves in size many times, um, if you have a basket of those, you're going to outperform over time. So I guess it's no surprise that uh, Nick's going to talk to us about Tesla, um, which is uh, one of the most popular shares to talk about out there. Um, so Nick, tell us why you own it and what you see in it. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Pete. So 
Yeah, I'm going to speak about a small unknown car company called Tesla, which I think is going to become in time the the biggest the biggest company in in the world. I think ultimately it's going to take over Apple and Microsoft in terms of micro in terms of market cap. And this and this is broadly why I think why that's going to happen. So let's take a step back if you and and look at the the broader opportunity. So battery electric vehicle sales. So not not so excluding plug-in hybrids, which are not the real deal. Uh, we're just, you know, it should be around um, 2 million units this year. That's relative to global um, annual auto sales of between 60 and uh, 70 million units a year. So the annual sales of bat battery electric vehicles, I've, because I think they're ultimately going to replace um, the internal combustion engine vehicles, are going to go up 35 fold in time. But it doesn't stop there because there's between 1 and 2 billion um you know, cars just sitting in driveways and in people's garages. Um, and ultimately, the entire existing fleet is going to be, uh, is going to need to be replaced. And so that, that's going to require, a, you know, no, a, more than a 700-fold jump in terms of the annual unit sales that we're seeing just this year. So there is a vast, vast, vast runway ahead. And I think Tesla is going to lead the way um, because they lead on so many fronts, which starts with product. So already the Model 3 um, has become just over, you know, just a matter of years has become the best selling um, premium vehicle globally. So it's taken over the BMW 3 Series, the, you know, the Mercedes C and E class, Audis. Um, and so, and this, and this is being relatively um, production constrained relative to, relative to the incumbents. Um, they only make, at, at this stage, they've got two factories, one in Shanghai, one in Fremont, California, and they're exporting to Europe. So, barely, you know, I think they're just, uh, you know, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, the outstanding demand, you know, not only for Model 3, but for the other cars too. So, this, this is the one that's, that's, that's particularly exciting, is the Model Y, where they are, where they just... You know, in the early days of ramping production, this is kind of like a kind of like a compact SUV. Um, it's very, very popular in the US. It's increasing uh, popularity in China, um, and Elon Musk believes that this is going to become uh, the most, the biggest selling car in terms of revenues, probably next year, and then probably the biggest selling car in terms of units or volumes the year after that, uh, likely overtaking. I think it's the Toyota Camry, which is the, the biggest selling in terms of units. So how, how are they going to get there? Um, so they've got two mega, mega, mega factories, um, which are being are opening really over the next few months. The first one is in, is in uh, Berlin. Um, it's a Giga Berlin. Um, this is going to serve the, serve the European market, and they're going to compete with Mercedes and, uh, and BMW on their home turf. And I think they will outcompete them. And VW's uh, group CEO um, is very, very concerned about the threat that Tesla poses. He publicly acknowledges it and says, we need to catch up. He's, uh, he's, even, um, he's even invited Elon Musk to speak to his group of, uh, group of managers. But he's facing resistance from various parts of the hierarchy in, um, in VW, including the unions. So it just illustrates the, the challenge facing incumbents when, when, you, when you're up against a, a disruptor. The next factory that's going to open around about the same time is Giga, Giga Texas. Um, this will serve the, you know, largely the U.S. market, and you're going to see a massive, massive ramp, uh, ramp in, the, in the Model Y. Uh, both factories, I think, are probably going to take about 12 to 18 months to reach uh, you know, full production. Um, and I think the, the estimates out there in terms of unit sales over the next three to five years are, are really underestimate, I think, what, what Tesla can achieve. Then the next thing, which, which doesn't get a lot of airtime, um, Tesla's main problem is not demand. There's, there's more than enough demand. There's waiting lists to, to get to buy the cars. It's actually supply. supply. There's a problem for the whole electric vehicle space. Now, Tesla's created their, their own new battery architecture called the 4680 cells, 
um, and they've, they've reinvented everything basically from the ground up. So these cells will be cheaper to make. They'll, they'll have, um, you know, allow the cars to, to a greater, greater range um, and, and more power. And they'll also the capital cost of these of the new battery factories will be a fraction um, of the existing technologies. So uh, this will this will allow them to scale up production far faster than than competitors. And I think it gives them a real sustainable competitive um, advantage. And just in terms of um, costs, return on invested capital, um, this this is a another kind of game changer for Tesla, I believe. And then finally, something that's that's sort of I think more long dated is Tesla's efforts around um, self driving, their self driving software, and then ultimately this kind of idea of a robo -tax taxi network of self driving cars. Um, even if you don't believe that there will be a fully fledged robo taxi network, you know Tesla is working towards a point where you can have a car that can. Um, you know, drive itself fairly safely on, on highways and in most circumstances. And people pay, you know, roughly the, the price that they're talking about is $200 a month, could be $100 a month. Um, and that's basically, there's no cost associated to that. It's just pure profit. So already Tesla's margins are starting to explode and, and look really favorable relative to other automakers. Next, you're going to add software margins to that. And Tesla, I think, is just going to gush profits. Um, and it's already starting to show that. So Tesla, you, you're starting to see early evidence of it, but I think we're going to see more. And I think ultimately it's profits that are going to make Tesla the, the largest company in the world. Uh, and with that, I'll turn to, I think it's Mike again. Thanks, Nick. Um, we're going to cross back over to Mark. He's going to talk us through Boston Scientific. Um, yeah, if I you. can, before I hand over to Mark, if I can just ask um, if you've got questions, I see Mark's answered a few of them already, but put them down in the Q&A. We've got 15 minutes at the end where we're going to uh, talk through some questions. There's a chat function as well. We'd prefer to try and keep it in one place, but uh, we'll start with the Q&A and try and address some of the chat uh, issues as well. But Mark, maybe you want to take us through the last company. Great. Pete, yeah. So Boston Scientific is a, is a mid-sized US-listed medtech player. By mid-sized, it's got a market cap of about $50 billion. Uh, that compares to some of its bigger competitors, uh, the likes of Medtronic at around 150 billion. So a nice size, but certainly with, you know, really decent uh, growth runway, if you think about it in the context of market cap. And just again, to, to, to sort of give you a sense of where it's come from, if you go back to 2010, Boston Scientific was a fairly monoline, slow growth, uh, fairly unexciting medical device maker focused chiefly on cardiac rhythm management. So doing pacemakers and things like that. You know, a really unexciting part of the medical field. They were mired in various uh, class actions related to some of their products, which, you know, frankly is, I think, something that someone that you have to see as almost a rite of passage in this industry. Um, you know, they're no more vulnerable to that type of thing than anyone else. Um, new management came in around 2013, a new CEO uh, called Mike Mahoney. And he's really led a transformation of this business, diversifying it into a range of new areas and particularly shifting the focus into higher growth areas of uh, medical intervention. And essentially what Boston Scientific describes itself as today is a, effectively a competitor to surgery. So they provide min a whole range of minimally invasive uh, uh, gadgets that essentially enable you to avoid going under the knife. Uh, which is obviously something that's pretty favorable. Um, but, you know, certainly as we saw COVID take hold, um, it didn't escape. And as we saw all those electric procedures um, pushed aside by hospitals filling up with uh, COVID patients, um, you know, Boston Scientific came under quite considerable pressure. And we used that as an opportunity to add the share to our portfolio, believing that it was going to be, um, you know, relatively temporary Phenomenon, And you certainly already started to see the company recovering, both operationally and in terms of share price. However, with each uh, COVID wave, it's pre presenting another opportunity for investors that missed it previously to get stuck in. And, you know, certainly the, the latest, uh, call it fourth wave or Omicron fears, have, see, have seen Boston Scientific get knocked again. 
Um, and certainly it's our view that as much as we're in the midst of, you know, a lot of uncertainty as we sit today, you know, the impact of COVID, particularly on the operations of businesses like this, are going to become less and less material. And as much as you can defer the type of procedures that Boston Scientific provides uh, devices for, uh, you can't completely um, cancel them. So in a sense, there's quite a lot of pent-up demand for its activities. Now, this gives you a sense of some of the guidance that Boston Scientific have, have recently put out. They had an investor day within the last two months or so. And you can see if you look back, first of all, at revenue to that earlier phase, which I mentioned, where it was a fairly slow growth, fairly boring business. As Mike Mahoney has driven this transition into higher growth areas um, of medical intervention, you've seen the organic revenue growth momentum picking up. Um, that is still ongoing. They've made a number of acquisitions recently, which has even further extended that sort of um, revenue growth range that they're looking to target. And note that this is organic revenue that they're talking about. There's a very attractive pipeline of new devices and recent acquisitions that I would expect as we see at reporting results over the next few years to actually deliver even better revenue growth than what is showing there. Um, as it integrates these businesses, it's been very successful at driving um, steady margin expansion and positive operating leverage. And so when you combine that, let's say, you know, approaching double digit revenue growth to margin expansion, you know, it's a business that ex COVID has already shown a very nice track record at solid double-digit revenue growth. So, you know, that's really what you're buying. Um, at an entry point now, when you look at the valuation, uh, which is, you know, once again, looking quite attractive. So you can see very recently with the latest news around COVID and the fourth wave um, that uh, Boston Scientific, as a result of the share price falling, that multiple has declined. So it's now trading on a forward PE of about 21 times. Um, for a business set to deliver, uh, as I say, steady, sort of, let's say, double-digit towards mid-teen hard currency revenue growth. And there are not many businesses like that that you're going to find on this sort of rating. And certainly, we have a lot of confidence around its ability to do that, given the kind of cadence of new devices, new acquisitions, um, and the mix of businesses that it's, it's, it's shifted the business towards. So we see this as a real workhorse in the portfolio um, and a share that we would hope can compound steadily over the next uh, number of years and will be a long-term holding for us. Great. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, we're going to finish off with uh, Henry Biddlecom. Um, Henry also has been with us for a number of years. Um, he helps Dave run the tech fund. Um, he's played a, a massive role in the, in the analyst team across local and uh, more recently in the last few years in global. Um, and he's going to talk us through Facebook, or what is known now as Meta. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, so today I'm talking about Facebook, um, recently renamed Meta. Um, and I guess it's a new name to better reflect the company's strategy to displace our real reality with a, a virtual one, uh, with a concept called the Metaverse. And I think it's a theme that sucked up a lot of the oxygen in the room lately. Um, and they're probably onto something given the airtime that the concept's gotten in just about every other tech company's um, earnings call last quarter. And you know, perhaps the, the crowning endorsement was the announcement by Microsoft that they'd be integrating Teams into Facebook Workplace over the coming months. Um, but that's not actually what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is Facebook's biggest near-term opportunity. Um, and it's a far more tangible and obviously commercial opportunity than the metaverse, in my opinion. And if you think about Facebook as a sort of a tri-pillar business, you've got the legacy advertising business on the left, um, you've got the metaverse opportunity on the right, and in the middle, um, you've got the more commercially obvious e-commerce opportunity, which for some reason, um, nobody's talking about, and I think the market may have forgotten about, and I guess um, that's the opportunity that we're seeing. Uh, next slide, please, Pete. So in previous webinars, we've spoken a lot about how Facebook continues to command 
uh, more of our attention on a daily basis than any other platform on earth, right? Um, the average person spends on average 58 minutes a day across the collective Facebook property. So WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. I mean, that's a phenomenal statistic. Um, it's still a highly relevant platform. Um, and you can see it in the download statistics that I've put up on the screen, whether you're looking at number of monthly downloads or number of monthly active users, um, they command four of the five top spots um, globally across both um, dominant operating systems. So that's iOS and, and, and Android. So that translates into some incredibly valuable advertising space. And of course, um, those are ads that advertisers are hoping will convert into sales. And on that basis, for a long time, it's made sense that the next logical phase in Facebook's evolution was always to become a storefront, giving you the ability to make the purchase in the very same moment that they've captured your attention. And that's what's happening right now with the recent launch of Facebook Shops in partnership with Shopify. And I think we're witnessing what could very well be the birth of a legitimate competitor to Amazon's third party marketplace, which today processes in the region of $300 billion in gross merchandise value on behalf of third party merchants. So it's a massive business. But there are a couple of key differences um, that give Facebook the advantage, in our opinion. So the first is they're offering to take a much lower take rate from merchants than Amazon at 5% versus the average of 15% um, from Amazon. Uh, secondly, Facebook is what I call a benign host. So in other words, they're not interested in competing with merchants. They simply want to provide a platform, whereas Amazon might start competing with you if you've got a successful product category, meaning third party merchants are more likely to work with Facebook as a matter of preference than Amazon for that reason. Um, and the third reason is that the influencer strategy, um, I think, is a very powerful one. People are more likely to spend a higher dollar value um, on a product that's used by people that they follow or by people that influence them via social media. So I think it's a significant, strategically it makes sense for Facebook, but we also need to put some numbers to it to quantify the opportunity for shareholders. Um, so we've started by assuming that Facebook shops can achieve a, a similar critical mass to Amazon uh, marketplace. Um, we don't think that's a crazy assumption given that e-commerce penetration rates overseas are still only sitting in the late teens to the early twenties, depending on the product category you're looking at. So that would translate into around $300 billion in annual gross merchandise value. And applying Facebook's take rate of 5% to that, that would equate to a revenue opportunity of roughly $15 billion per year. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like a significant number for a company that will report over $100 billion in revenue this year. But um, the important consequence of changing Facebook into a storefront is also that the advertising revenue becomes a lot more valuable. Now, looking at the Amazon model um, as a comparison, again, they generate about 15 cents in, ad in advertising sales for every dollar in GMV that they process. So applying that same principle to Facebook, their yield on GMV will likely be closer to 20% and not 5%, which would mean $300 billion in GMV would translate into $60 billion in incremental revenue for Facebook. And now it starts to sound like a serious opportunity, doesn't it? Um, so from a valuation perspective, if you apply a, a price to sales ratio of roughly nine times, which is where Facebook tends to trade over time, that could add around 50%. Um, to Facebook's market cap. So we think it's a serious opportunity for shareholder value creation over the coming years. Um, how will the market start to price this in? Well, I guess um, that's difficult to predict. It'll probably happen in a gradual fashion as the company starts to report progress on that front. But the important thing is we still think that um, there's a long runway for growth for Facebook from here. Um, and it'll come in the form of a second, way, a second wind um, with that e-commerce opportunity. Um, so I think in conclusion with Facebook, you've got a great combination where you're paying a very reasonable price um, for the business today. You're paying roughly 22 times um, next year's earnings. And secondly, um, you've got a significant commercial opportunity that the market isn't attributing much value to at this point in time. So I really like that as a play going into 2022. And Pete, that's it from me. Great. Thanks, guys. And a special thank you to Henry, who... He's sitting at home, COVID positive. Uh, yeah, I hope not to see, any, see anybody walking around in the background and that you're isolating properly. Um, but Henry still came to the party. Um, we 
we've we aim to keep this to about an hour. We've got about uh, five, we'll probably run uh, five minutes over. Uh, you got any questions? Please put them in the Q and A. I see that uh, Mike did answer a few of the questions. Mark, maybe if you want to take a minute or two, just identifying some pertinent questions that were asked and um, and what you had to say. Great, sure, will do, Pete. I got a bit jumped the gun a little bit there. So the first question was, uh, you know, how we think about the Nigerian risk and multi-choice, and I, I suspect that that probably relates to the uh, the tax matter that's been very newsworthy for the second part of this year. Um, and, you know, certainly what we've seen with these businesses is that often it's, it's having the courage to buy them when the news is a bit negative around Nigeria. That proves to be the most fruitful thing to have done um, in the longer term. Um, so essentially, we think that this matter will be resolved uh, favorably. It is an area where certainly the, uh, the rules are much clearer um, uh, around how the tax works in Nigeria, if you would believe it. Um, it's taken longer than expected for us to get to that point, but that's the outcome we're looking for. I think the other point to note is that, you know, say relative to MTN, the importance of Nigeria to multi-choice is actually much less significant. In fact, it's a loss-making business. And, you know, cynically, I, I raise the question over if the Nigerians absolutely dig their heels in over this, um, despite what we expect and, and think about it, whether you know multi choice could literally walk away from that market. Um, I hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, you know we, we're certainly expecting that that will be resolved um, in, in multi choice's favour. Um, another question involves what whether we see potential M and A uh, potential takeout of multi choice, and I think that relates to the um, fact that Vivendi has been building a stake in in multi choice is now up to about a fifteen percent stake. It's been quite clever at using any pullback in multi choice as an opportunity to buy buy up. Um, the problem really is that the, the South African regulations don't allow a foreign owner of a media asset. So I think it's unlikely you're going to see a complete buyout of of multi choice. But I also think it's you know it would be very strange for Vivendi to be sitting happily with a very a sort of small passive stake. Bear in mind that Vivendi did make a play, we understand, years ago for the African operations, which MultiChoice turned down. And I'm asking the question whether possibly you might see uh, Vivendi maybe tender the shares that it's bought in MultiChoice in exchange for those uh, for, for those African assets in time to come. Remember that, as I said, it looks to us like it's actually valued negatively. So if there was to do to, to be a deal like that, it could be hugely value accretive um, for for um, multi-choice from current levels. Um, and then there was a question that I also answered just around cash generation and how Afrimat is funding its acquisitions. It's been very clever at the way it's done its acquisitions, actually. Um, if you take the Nkomati mine deal, for example, it, uh, you know, by the time it sold off the non-core operations that it acquired alongside that mine, it effectively got the mine for almost nothing. Um, you know, the the fact that commodity prices have been as strong as they have been, well ahead of what they forecasted, the balance sheet's in actually far better shape to fund that uh, these acquisitions that they've made organically. Um, they have indicated that should they see opportunities, and it's not done with acquisitions yet, um, they may be prepared to issue equity, but we're looking at maybe sort of 7% additional shares. So it's not dramatically material. Um, in fact, may improve the liquidity in the, in the share to some extent. So those are a couple of the questions that are answered online. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, there's a question on Alviva and Pinnacle, somebody with a long memory saying that, but uh, Jeremy, um, they were bedeviled by EOH type reputational issues. Have these been forgiven or forgotten by the market? I think we're talking about events that probably happened about 10 years ago. Um, where there's some accusations about bribes to the South African police force. Uh, where the guy making the accusation, accusations, I think, landed up working for their main competitor. Um, but that, yeah, I mean, that's really a, a thing of the past. It's had a new CEO for many years, um, and I don't think really impacts the value or, or prospect of the business. Um, the David, um, just before we bought Ginkgo, and actually gave us quite a nice entry point, there was a class action suit filed against Ginkgo for failing to disclose that most, if not all of the company's revenue came from related parties. Um, that's concealing the near total dependence on related parties. Perhaps you can just put that, it's obviously an issue that we're well on top of and, and looked at prior to buying the share. Um, perhaps if you could just put that in context in the way that you're viewing it. Yeah, look, we take all those things very seriously. So, um, 
I suppose you know this is the thing with the new with the new industries. You're trying to create uh, a lot of other uh, businesses around you that might become dependent on you, right? So um, in their latest set of results, um, Ginkgo did disclose that some of their revenues are from third parties. Uh, it's about thirty eight percent. Um, but the important thing is it's come down dramatically from a year ago. So last year, it was just under 60% of their revenues was from third-party companies. So in other words, sorry, not third, but related uh, related parties. So those are companies that um, either they uh, are very closely aligned with or where their directors might be on the boards of those companies. But you can see now that, and this is something that I've been monitoring is, is how is their customer base expanding? Um, and so you can see in our related parties is now uh, 37% of revenues in the last quarter. They've picked up some very big customers like Bayer. Uh, Chanel is another customer, uh, customer of theirs. Robert Tay, uh, you know, French fragrance uh, company. So in time, they'll be picking up many, many large customers and then the related party uh, element will become much smaller and that will reduce the risk uh, in the business. It's always something you've got to watch for, for a relatively new business. Um, but, you know, obviously it's something we, we're watching closely. They are very transparent on this now. So uh, in their last set of, <clears throat> their last earnings call, they, you know, they spoke about all of this at length. Thanks, Dave. Um, Liam, one for you with respect to transaction capital. Um, with second-hand car price inflation having risen sharply, questioned by Nick Rogers, in reaction to the chip shortage and supply chain constraints, would you recommend being patient on transaction capital at current valuations until prices cool off, um, or will they have the ability to scale, mitigate any car price normalization? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the response to that would be, I, I don't think we, we would try and, you know, define our edge in terms of identifying transaction capital as, a, as an investable portfolio company by trying to sort of um, make big forecasts on, on the second hand car market and, and things that we probably need to take either their guidance of or, or just look at circumstance and, and what's happening around the world. So, I mean, just for context, uh, there are places, uh, I think there's some, certainly some cars in the UK where the price of a second-hand car is the same price as a new car just because there, there's no supply at the moment. So that, that clearly is, is a, um, a, a moment in time and, and that, that set of circumstances is not going to last forever uh, because it makes no sense longer term when, when the supply eases, eases off or the supply constraints ease off. Um, in the case of transaction capital, I think, you know, way, way of looking at it would be to treat it like we did with, um, we, we treated the iron ore price with Aprimat. Um, while the price is elevated, it's not, it's the, the prices of those cars are elevated. It's not necessarily what we had had in our base case when we first looked at it. And, and the ability to grow volume um, to mitigate some kind of price decline, um, which we don't think is like severe, um, as, in, as was the case with the iron ore, which is probably, you know, double the price that we originally thought. With cars, it's certainly not nearly that severe. But we think that they'll are more than make up with volumes going forward um, to mitigate any sort of deflation or, or slowdown in, in, the, in the growth of, of prices of second-hand cars. It's far, far more um, important to us is, is, the, is the business model and, and the functioning of that and, and the offering to... To the, to the broader market and the appeal of that. Well, thanks, Liam. Um, and maybe I'll just take two last questions. Uh, one from David Faf. Faf, which SA resource company is best positioned to take advantage of the growth in EVs? Maybe to extend that to kind of the green climate, where all, all kinds of um, uh, electricity transmission needs copper, um, there you've got a company like Glencore, which has got the highest proportion of copper. Anglo-American also sits with quite a bit of copper. Um, interesting to see that Sabanya. Now, obviously, the platinum companies, um, they primarily, more than 50% of the PGM metals are being used in internal combustion engines. So they look to, um, to you know, for the growth of EVs to be a negative. They're betting on the growth of the hydrogen economy. But you've seen uh, Sabanya invest in, in lithium and other commodities which are suited uh, to the kind of EV world. And then a last question um, from Ilza, and this is to Nick Dennis. Uh, the price target for Tesla once gigafactories operational, 
And who's going to be the biggest competitor? Traditional internal combustion uh, engine manufacturers or Chinese EV manufacturers like uh, like Neo? Um, yeah. So look, I, I don't have a price target. Um, who knows what the sh- what 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 the share is going to do and what sort of um, you know how, how, you know. How, how flows are going to go and all of that kind of thing. It's, uh, I've no idea, but, um, uh, look, I, I would say, um, in, in terms of competition, um, I think the legacy players are really going to struggle. And I can see, I could see a scenario where it's a bit like the, the Japanese automakers going into the U S say 30, 40 years ago and out competing, are competing the U S uh, the D- Detroit three kind of, at the low end, um, which is you, you can get these shifts when there's a kind of a new, a new paradigm. Um, that's it. I'm not wild about Neo's business model, which is that they, they use a whole battery switch. So they, they'll actually, they'll take the, the whole battery pack out of the car and swap you in with a new one. Um, that, um, uh, that to me, I think is something that's very difficult to scale. So, I mean, long story short, um, you know, I think, it, it's well. It's it's really not obvious to me who who the number two or three players are going to be for a long time, and I think uh, Tesla's advantage over the rest of the pack is going to be. Um, I mean, they've got a significant lead. They've got a significant need. It might be a bit different in China because the Chinese government will try to favor their own automakers, and it'll probably make it more favorable for them. Um, uh, and then you've got a handful of players. So. Yeah, I wish I could give you a better answer, but it's just like Tesla and then the rest are miles behind. Great. Thanks, Nick. Guys, we've gone a little bit over our time, so we're going to call it there. Um, We hope you enjoyed the session, and I'll hand back to Dale to say a final goodbye. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Um, We are at time. Uh, Just um, a moment, just to thank Pete personally. Pete, thank you for, for all the time you've given Essentials this year. I think you've been the most regular speaker. So thank you very much. Um, We'd like to take this opportunity to wish all of you a happy new year and a festive season and hopefully um, uh, a non-event of a fourth wave. Thank you very much and goodbye.